If you can stop thinking about fucking for one second, we'll maybe teach a lesson in this class today. Welcome to the Concert Crucible Podcast, where things are larger than they appear. <laughs> Especially in mirrors? <laughs> I'm Jim. And I'm Ryan. And we've got a, we've got an interesting podcast lined up for today, uh, because one of the things that I immediately noticed the first time I came here is you have an F-ton full of books. Yes. Like, just, you have a lot of books, and I realized that... Much in the same way of when you're a kid, it's like, you like ice cream? I like ice cream. We could be best friends. You have a lot of books. I have a lot of books. We could be best friends. We could have a podcast. I mean, you, you, you haven't Another seen podcast. it. You haven't seen it when we film here at Jim's place, but in the previous couple of podcasts, you'll notice when we went to my place. He also has a lot of I books. I have a lot of books. So then we thought, you know what? That'd be a good topic for... Let's talk about our books. Let's talk about our, our I, library. I was, when, I, when I think about my books, I was, I was house-sitting for a friend of mine a few years ago. And I was just, it was late at night. They were at Disney. And I, I tweeted them because I really just wanted to read something. Not on a screen. I'd mm-hmm. been staring at a screen all day doing work. And uh, I said, where, where are your books? And they're like, oh, they're upstairs in the bookshelf. And they had like a like a row of self help books and Lord of the Rings and a bunch of books for the kids because that's how you do when you mm-hmm. have kids. And uh, I'm like, no, 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 like your books, like the rest of your books, because they just moved into their house and I figured that you know like maybe they were somewhere else or I'm like no, no, those are those. Are. It took me about ten minutes to realize that I'm the one that's weird. I have about seven bookshelves full of books, all like triple stack, three deep, and no. Yeah, you definitely have more books than I do. Um, I like books. Well, so do I. It, it started a lot. It started quite early for me. I mean, I always liked the idea of the old timey mahogany desk set in a room full of books stacked floor to ceiling. For example, Beauty and the Beast. That library that he's got, where you need a ladder to move around the room to reach books. I wanted that. I really wanted that. Like I, that I think that scene was written f- for girls. I think a lot of times I, it seems like in my experience a lot of people reference that scene in terms of like a way to a woman's heart through books or whatever, especially if they're a book nerd. But I absolutely love that. I don't even think the like the beast never used that room. Like it, it, he did not care. <laughs> How's he gonna turn the pages with those giant talons? But he didn't care about his library. The library never seemed to be about him. So, granted, if you look at the timeline of Beauty and the Beast, he was incredibly young, apparently, when yeah. the spell was put on. But, uh, but I mean, like, the, he didn't care much about the library. This was his gift to Belle. But in the movie, like, I saw that. I'm just like, I want that. Like, I want... I don't know how. I don't know in what way. But I want that. Um, and it just went from there, I guess. But That's awesome. No, so I, Icebreaker, then, what's your formative book? What is one of your formative books? Everybody's got lots of them. Yeah, I guess we should we should go ahead and make an internet promise here that this is going to be the first in a series of podcasts, not necessarily consecutively. Maybe we'll wait till next season to pick the libraries back up. Yeah. But we're going to definitely be talking about our libraries. And I do like books. The books that we have and the books that we want and stuff. So you can look forward to more more podcasts the internet promises uh, and so every time I think we're going to ask about formative books oh yeah so um, I would like to hear about your formative books too in the comments down below yeah so because um, I'm always looking for new things to read so I would say one of my formative books uh, and this might be late in my in my formative years but I don't know I think of my formative years all the way up until middle of university I'm still in my formative years uh, yeah I guess I guess that's true I, I don't know where I would stop considering my formative years to uh, to be ongoing but which is a really awkward way of saying that I'm out of my formative years anyways uh, but this this book or at least the story that I encountered um, was in I think it was grade 11 my English class and we were given the circular ruins by Borges to read and I remember that was the first time that I read a story that just just blew my mind when I read it. I won't spoil it. I, I highly encourage you to go check it out. Um, either online, I imagine... No, it's not... It wouldn't be in public domain yet. Um, so you'd have to 
probably buy the book. Buy I will the find e-book. a link to it and put it in the show notes. Yeah, I mean, it, Borges' stuff was collected in several anthologies. Um, so anyways, the first time I read this story, and it just, I read through it, and it has like a like a twist ending, and I, I didn't see it coming. And it was just one of those just holy... Like I, I, I didn't know that fiction could do that. That was the first time I had, I experienced that thing, that idea that fiction can can impact you so much. And funny enough, when I first went to university and I was doing the campus tour, uh, the March campus tour. So I'd already been accepted, and I was coming just to check out campus. Um, and a friend of mine who I went to high school with, he started university the year before me because I stuck around for a, a victory lap. And so he joined us on the campus tour to show me around. We went to the bookstore, and I was walking through the, the shelves. And I'm like, oh, Borges. I remember reading him in, in um, whichever teacher it was, whatever class it was. Um, and so he decided to buy that book for me as a gift, as a welcome to, to U- nice. University of Waterloo. And then I, in turn, have done that for other people whenever it may be. They might not be coming to to. Um, UW, but they're going into university and they come to visit me, so we'll go to the bookstore and, and, I, will, and I will buy... Well, no, I'll buy them a book that's relevant to their interests. Um, and I like that idea of introducing people to campus in that way. So, uh, The Circular Ruins by by George Louis Borges, and forgive me if I'm mispronouncing that, but we'll put a link down in, in the, the description. Notes. Oh, yeah. Now, my formative, one of my formative books, probably the most important formative book that I have, especially because Dan will get mad at me if I if I say that something else is um, is Maniac McGee by Jerry Spinelli. I read it in the third grade. Uh, I had just moved to a whole new town. I had uh, started at a new school, and I was far away from everything else, and I had no friends at all. And Maniac McGee is about a boy who runs away and goes and and winds up in a new town. Um, and has no friends at all, and he makes friends. He's also weird and homeless and crazy, and he's not he's not crazy, but he's he has this. It's a town. Like thinking back on it, it's 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 one of those sort of books just like engineered to win an award. It's a town divided by racial tensions, but Maniac McGee isn't conscious of those um, tensions, and so he violates all these racial taboos. Um, and it doesn't wind up, you know, uniting the town and, and have them singing songs in the end. Um, but he does wind up finding a home with some people. And the other thing he does is run. He's an excellent runner. He does all the, he does, he's, he's like a sort of contemporary Huckle, Huckleberry Finn. And by contemporary, I mean the 1980s, where you would do things like go outside and kids spend most of their time outside. <laughs> but... It's the thing that always got me was was the sort of genuine nature of his compassion. His, his the the amount of time he spends with people who are trapped and hopeless, not in a sense of, of ministering to them or anything like that, but just I mean, people who who they don't have a place so they stay in band shells or they're low income and things like that. Like when I was growing up and and and. and they still are. I mean, we go back to our podcast on class. Links over Ryan's face, as usual. But uh, those are my people. And that, I, I, I identified with him in that way, too. That, that it, wasn't, it wasn't, you know, suburban life. This, this was downtown, you know, struggling to get by. And they would struggle. And they, and they, and they, they, they did struggle. But they had all these dreams. I remember Grayson, who I've definitely talked about in a podcast before. Um, he he was an old man. He lived in a band shell. He clean he he did all the yard work and things like that. But once he was a pitcher in the minor leagues, and, and there was this moment when it, when he he tells he tells me, um, McGee that he says I yeah and and the tone of voice is that I am not what you see here. I am bigger than this. I am a pitcher, and I, I that always grabbed me because as as the poor kid, new kid in town, you always want to you you want to feel bigger than that. And that one day I'd be like, I would I would I would speak a sentence like that, and people would know that I was bigger than than I was. I have not found that sentence yet, but 
Um, it is certainly not. I am a philosopher. <laughs> um, it is. It might be that I am a podcaster, but we'll get there. But that is that is the sentence, that, and, and that is really the the, the 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 sort of that was one of my big takeaways from that book, among other things. Um, also, it was a really fun kids book. Uh, it won uh, I forget which 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 medal or award or something like that, but. I remember because the copy, the first copy I read, which is in my classroom, uh, had a had a like print of the award on it to prove it, because otherwise you wouldn't know. Slash any excuse to print a new edition. Yeah. But I will also put a link to that in the show notes. You can probably find it on Amazon or whatnot for super cheap because it's like thirty years old now. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's it's formative books are I think a heavy topic. Uh, I mean, we all have formative media and things that that sort of. They they spring to mind immediately, and they are an integral part of the things that make us who we are. Uh, but that is not what we're going to talk about today. We want to talk about libraries. And so, in addition to, do you have your formative books in your library? I have a few of them, but my, the books that I have in my library currently are um, from university on. So, if a book was formative for me in university... Um, then it's made it in there most of my childhood books are if they're not in boxes in the basement then they're probably in boxes with my mother um, who lives stateside Um, because a lot of the books that I had when I was a kid were um, the child novel series so such as um, Goosebumps, Animorphs so I had a lot of those books Um, actually you know what I'll, I'll say it now so I remember it, but uh, the next time we talk about our formative books, I'm going to talk about how much of an impact Calvin and Hobbes had on me. Nice. Because I have the collections, the various collections that came out that bound them together. Um, but yeah, so a lot of my childhood formative ones are currently not in my library uh, proper. They're in my extended collection. <laughs> oh, your extended collection, sir. Oh. <laughs> and I would also like to say, since I'm going to be pompous about an extended collection, is I don't call my office the office or my library. I mean, the library is the, the collection of books. I refer to the office space as my study. To be fair, we are sitting... I can't really say much because we are sitting in my studio. Yeah. So I have a study, and when people come looking for me... T- um, Sarah can tell them that I am in seclusion in the study. I don't have a my wing back chair. Or I don't have a mahogany desk, but I have a crystal skull. I'm gonna have a, an hourglass and a, and the, actually the little knickknack that you gave me from Fan Expo. No, no, no. Um, Pax East. Pax East. Yeah, it's that's on my desk. Oh, nice. My that's a friendship token. I see it as so. My little mementos that remind me of various things. That I will have to give you another knickknack today. <laughs> uh, my desk will just be full of your stuff, I guess. <laughs> mm. Ryan's desk seems like a pretty good place to keep my stuff. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, what about you? Are, are a lot of your formative books in your uh, library? A bunch of them. I mean, I've got you know Marcus Rose's Meditations. I, I have at least three copies of Maniac McGee. I went through this phase where anytime I saw one in a used bookstore, I would just buy it so I could give it to somebody. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got over that, but I still have a couple extra copies to give away to random people. Uh, I always so I always wind up with doubles. Hmm. But I mean, thinking of just just the content of my library in general, um, it's I mean I have a fair amount of philosophy books, which is unsurprising for I guess somebody with 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 two degrees in philosophy. But uh, mostly it's science fiction. Uh, fantasy stuff from the like, like stuff from the the seventies, eighties, uh, a bunch of stuff from the sixties, uh, classical lit. Um, I don't have a lot of contemporary lit, which makes me sort of, I'm I'm working on it, but mm. I think the only piece of contemporary literature that I own is the Bolt in Our Stars, <laughs> which is really contemporary, but mm. and then it came out a couple of years ago. But I I, I I am working on fixing that. As I want there to be a place, but yeah, mo- the majority of it is is science fiction because uh, I love future history and that, and along with classical lit and philosophy, which I sort of I try and jump back and forth. But yeah, I don't I don't make a lot of room for um, romances or historical fiction or um, like I, I I struggle to think of genres of book. That I that I know. I mean, obviously, like, like stuff like 
a lot of nonfiction that I just don't care about. Like my all my nonfiction is politics, sociology, psychology, um, hi- history, you know, medieval studies and stuff like that. I don't have a lot of stuff on nature or um, the science. I do have is is basic stuff. Like it's like it's it's physics. It's not it's not you know building stuff or 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 things about things. I don't have anything about biology or it's just not. It's not a thing I'm interested in, and and if I need to learn facts about biology, I can look them up on the internet. Mm-hmm. And the internet is, I think, has really shaped and changed how my library content works because I don't feel like I need as much nonfiction. But there are certain bits of nonfiction that you can't get from the internet. Mm-hmm. I mean, whether it's books on Harold with pretty pictures. Or just books that are authoritative on their subject. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, it's one thing to go and read a blog post or read a bunch of Wikipedia entries and feel like you know something. But it is another thing entirely to read a book about somebody or or by someone who spent several years writing that book and learning about the thing uh, in question. Mm -hmm. I find um, my my library tends to skew heavily towards philosophy, so um, primary texts... Um, some of it was required course reading, but a lot of it was just things that I felt it was important to buy or important to snag. And I say snag because, for example, when Richard Holmes cleared out his office... I got a big pile of books from that. Yeah, I I definitely went through and picked a lot of books that I was uh, wanted to add to my collection. And to a certain degree, it is a collection. It's not a collection that you can necessarily think of as complete. Or, you know, like, for example, as a kid when I would buy Pokemon cards because I didn't know how to play, it was essentially a collection for me. And it was easy to know when your collection was complete because you knew every card that was printed in the series and all you had to do was find those ones. But with the books that I have, um, and I imagine you're probably similar with, say, science fiction, is your collection is never really complete. It's fairly open. I mean, perhaps you can collect everything from one author or you can collect everything... See, I don't know, because, like, for example, Shannon, when we did the Cartesian course, right, I didn't know how many Cartesians there were. I just thought of Descartes and then some of the immediate people who responded. And then the nice little narrative that gets stitched through um, the history of philosophy courses tends to only pick up these major key figures. And yeah. you don't realize that there's a lot of people outside of those those uh, dialogues that goes on between the books that are actually commentating on it so like like i said the cartesians in the, the especially the french cartesians there's just yeah. so many there that, yeah so i mean you did you, it's really hard to say it's complete in that regard um but f- it's still in my my eyes a collection i'm collecting books and it's very much um actually my buddy's got a uh, Brendan, who yeah. we might get on the podcast sometime in the future, he's got this interesting idea that I can't remember where he borrowed it from, but it's the it's probably from Black Swan, the idea of an anti library. Mm-hmm. Um, that the the library that we have on our shelves does not represent everything that we know, because there's no way that I could ever, with a straight face, say that I've read every book that I own, and I don't think I'll ever read every book that I own uh, through laziness or because I buy them faster than I can read them. But at the very least, my library uh, represents everything at the very least that I probably don't know. There's more in my library that I don't know than the things that I have in my head. The set of things that I know is very much smaller than the, my library. And my library is meant to, as a, a, sometimes can be a metaphor for maybe the do- domain of knowledge of everything that can be known or whatever. And then I only know a tiny little bit of that. Um, and so my library reminds me of everything that I possibly don't know. It's a, it can be um, humbling in that regard. See, I don't know that I think about mine like that at all. Um, I do, like, like if I have a series of books that I'm that I'm reading or, or something like that, I do try and, and, and get all of them, mm-hmm. just so I can I can have the complete thing so that I can... Harry Potter, whoop, whoop. I actually books. only have one Harry Potter book. I, between Sarah and I now, we have two complete series. Nice. Yeah, no, I, I, but, but like, I just, I, I, I just came back, um, from visiting family with a box full of books and, and I managed to fill out a couple of series that I had, 
uh, previously had holes in, but that's mostly because like I want to read that series from start to finish. Uh, and then I, you know, if I lend it to somebody, I have the series available so that they can borrow it, sort of one book at a time or something like that. Like it's like, but in terms of a larger scale collection, like I don't, I don't, I don't know that I collect authors anymore. I think I did it at one point, and there are certainly still a lot of authors that I will that I will jump at. But we might be talking about two different things here because my library is mostly nonfiction, and mm -hmm. where your library Mine is, is mostly, mostly fiction. fiction. And that's I think I think you yeah you you were yours as sort of a body of knowledge, whereas mine is. Uh, what do I talk about in the precast? Uh, imagination fuel. I, I really like that concept. It's it's full of these ideas mm -hmm. that other people have had, mm -hmm. and I can I can read a book and get a get a sense of. Partly it's because I, I think I, I enjoy writing and I mostly enjoy writing fiction, mm -hmm. um, but I can get a sense of of this idea that they had, and 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 hopefully. It will like like at best it will transform me, but at worst it will still give me an idea that I didn't have. Mm -hmm. And it might be theirs, it might be a variation of theirs, but it helps me incorporate. I love comic books for the same reason. I've got you know ten or twenty thousand comic books on my hard drive, mm -hmm. and sometimes I like I just I just you know last night I just read fifty or sixty of them in the, in the course of an hour, and. It helps me sort of restructure the way that I think about stuff, and because because it's it's just people have have been talking and thinking about a lot of things. I mean, and, and most of my nonfiction, which is philosophy or biographies or, or stuff like that, is the same kinds of things. It's it's not so much knowledge about stuff as it is ideas that other people had, mm -hmm. and that I can that I can, you know, sort of burn for fuel to help me imagine new worlds or better things or, or new arguments or I mean that's and that's really what I'm looking for I is, is my my library isn't about knowledge it's about me it's about uh, helping change me or transform me into someone more useful or someone someone better adapted hmm. so I mean if I like right now I'm not reading books by dudes and this has got me reading a lot of sci-fi and, and fantasy and, and classical lit. I just finished uh, Gone with the Wind a little while ago, which, by the way, is definitely the great American novel. Okay. Like, 100 pages into it, you're like, wow, this is the great American novel. I mean, to be fair, 400 pages into it, you're like, wow. You know, these these Confederates really are hard done by. I mean, this whole, <laughs> they got really get a raw deal in the, oh, wait, no. But for a minute, you're just, you think that. <laughs> but... You know, it's 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 furnishing me. It, I, I won't say that it's that it's furnishing me with entirely new perspectives on, on on life or the universe or anything, but it's interesting to read science fiction from the '80s that wasn't written by uh, white guys. Mm -hmm. And I I, I I don't know that I'm prepared to, to to make a distinction about the differences between female and male authors because I I think that I'm sort of primed for for noticing differences, so I couldn't say anything meaningful about it. Mm -hmm. but it's got me reading a different set of books than I might have otherwise picked mm -hmm. um, and I otherwise I'd, I'd probably wind up with the same sort of like future war or cyberpunk or um, you know uh, where, where all the heroes are they're either um, super strong dudes or because if you're a super progressive author in the 70s or 80s um you write you write a story about a sexy badass lady, and you put her on the cover of your book, and you put her in like latex, because that way, everyone who's go who's gonna buy your book knows that this is a book about a sexy badass lady. Seriously, I have a big stack of those books. I have no interest in reading them, <laughs> but they're there. <laughs> And some of them are probably pretty good. I mean, to be fair, but it's it's just that that. It, but it's either one or the other. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I I think we we at heart. I mean, in the same way that you want to have a big giant room. That how would you organize your big giant room? 
Uh, so right now, my organization is largely around topics. I don't know how if I had more books, how would I, like if I would alphabetize it or go by the Dewey Decimal System, but... Um, right you now, have little font cards. You just have like, would you would I, you have a card a card catalog? I would, as long as somebody else did it, because I would be far too lazy to do You're it. You're gonna need own. an intern. Yeah, I'm gonna need an intern. Uh, so right now, my library is uh, each shelf, or if a, t- a topic or a theme goes more than one shelf, but each section of the the shelves are are dedicated to certain uh, general themes and topics. So. Um, my fiction, um, like my, my, um, the, the fiction I consider to be important to me, uh, which oddly enough might seem weird that I have Douglas Adams right beside Borges, but to me, those are two important authors in terms of fiction. Uh, those are side by side with a lot of my lit theory books, Mm -hmm. uh, lit crit and whatnot. So analysis of the seven main plots of all the Western literature kind of deal and whatnot. Um, and then next to that is all of the books that are biographies and autobiographies, which are largely skewed towards Theodore Roosevelt, because I, I have I've bought and read the three books from the Roosevelt, which we talked about in the earlier podcast. Yep. Now I'm making my way through Winston Churchill, but I have a George Carlin's autobiography, um, and I have some primary text by Roosevelt, like the, his Rough Riders journals. Uh, that was published, so I picked that up. Uh, and then from there, a lot of the shelves typically are primary, um, are, um, yeah, primary readings from philosophy, so written by the authors themselves. Uh, and I have two or three of those shelves, and then a shelf or so of um, uh, secondary sources or essays about it. So companion pieces to say um, Hume or, or Kant uh, and then I have a lot of um, socio-political economic books um, less to do with mm-hmm. um, le- less to do it's, it's typically more just economics books um, whether or not they're pure economics like I have um, Adam Smith but I also have like Freakonomics and um, Dan Irely with behavioral economics um, so those are all kind of mishmashed together in one shelf, along with a few historical books, um, like a book on Czechoslovakia and why it failed as a state. Um, but those those could probably be cleaned up into a better system. Uh, and then just other books like textbooks, cookbooks, uh, the dummy guides that I bought, like uh, the gummy the dummy's guide to logic that I bought in university. <laughs> uh, and then I do have a small section on religious texts, uh, the Bible, um, the, and I can never pronounce it, the Bhagavad Gita? Bhagavad Gita? Yeah, I have that. Um, some stuff from Christian science. Um, uh, I have the Portable Atheist, which was an anthology collected by Hitchens. Mm. But it's I don't I don't think Hitchens has anything in it other than his introductions. It's all excerpts from um, historical figures, starting with Lucretius, going all the way through to modern times. Um, so I have that I consider that a part of the religious section, even though a lot of it might de- deal more with science. Like Lucretius was talking about um, an atomic theory of the universe and whatnot, yeah. but it was all. Um, reality as divorced from the, the need for gods uh, and then I think that's about it because other than that I have a section of books that I'm currently reading but that would fit into other books so yeah. um, you know like history of philosophy but then those books are also spread out throughout various places in my house so <laughs> on my on my nightstand I have a book in both washrooms I have a couple books you know in the living room I'll have a you're book you're like a squirrel I am like a squirrel I put books everywhere so that when I have a free moment and I'm not on my tablet I'll read um, but so that that's generally how and you know what in a future podcast I think what we'll do is we'll actually be a camera, camera yeah, person we can, for each we other can go, and we'll, we can go, we'll and, go through and, and, tour. and do a tour of each yeah, other's books see, see again like, like it, it's interesting to me that you're, you're library and this actually seems entirely normal I, I, <laughs> I again I think that I am the one that is weird because your library is entirely about organizing the, the knowledge that you have there mm-hmm. my library is about me mm-hmm. uh, my, my books I have read shelf um, wh- what ones are not boxed up 
um, is again it's it's all stacked sideways triple deep but it's organized chronologically from when I read them slash in the manner that they will best fit on the shelf mm -hmm. but I mean part of that's just from the I, I developed this habit of I would finish a book and I would add it to the stack and I would finish a book and I would add it to the stack and eventually you start to develop stacks mm -hmm. and you got to figure out what to do with them but the thing I, I learned when I when I when I had to figure out something to do with those stacks was I can walk backward through a stack of books or through several stacks of books now through an entire shelf and a half like, like bookshelf mm -hmm. um, and doing that walks me back through my life and similarly if I need to find a book all I have to do is remember what I was doing when I read it maybe I was working in a certain place or I was thinking about a certain thing or whatnot and I can I can look at the shelf and see the context of books and know where I am in my life by that context and then pick out the book that I need. Um, there, are, I can remember books that were good for, for me when I was in certain moods or in certain uh, head spaces and find that book. I can remember books that I, and this goes back, you know, 25 years I've got books on that shelf. Probably, probably closer to 20. Mm -hmm. But... I mean, I can I can trait I can sort of follow it backward, and it pulls to it pulls through all these memories that I otherwise don't you know don't really have access to, because it it, it pushes me into this context where I'm like, where was I when I when I read this text of Aristotle? I was working at the UW library and I was pulling night shifts and I was my first Aristotle and I realized that I probably should have read Aristotle before reading other philosophy because God did it make Kant make so much more sense <laughs> and there was a you know there were a pair of Greek guys that I that I that I ran into and I checked their bags because that was my job and they were they were marveling at the fact that I was reading Aristotle and they were big they were big Aristotle fans and we wound up talking for like half an hour about posterior analytics uh, which is a text that I still don't really understand but I haven't I haven't read it recently or, or enough but I get like I can I can walk back and I can find I can find fiction and it's hard it, like it's hard for me to tell if the book is good or not but because because it, it, it occupies that position in my memory in the same way that like you know old TV shows and whatnot you're like you remember them being great and then you mm -hmm. watch them and you're just like oh my god I can't believe I watched this ever. I don't care how old I was, what was wrong with me. But what I'm looking for, when I'm looking for that, isn't whether a book is good, it isn't a specific piece of information. Um, it's, it's the feeling that I associate with that book. I mean, the same with the authors. It's, it's often, it's the feeling I associate with that author's books i know that if if you want to read good fantasy from the 80s written by a woman uh you want to read mercedes lackey and there are there are lots of other names that the belong on the list that list there's a ton or slow look win and Anne mccaffrey and whatnot but for me because that's what i was reading that's my she is my go-to name um, and if I go to the shelf and I and I look and I and I and I think about how old I was and I was reading Mercedes Lackey, I was probably about fourteen, fifteen. Uh, I can trace it back, and you'll what you'll find is a big stack of Mercedes Lackey books. Um, yeah, it's it's it, my entire library is 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 structured around me and who I am. Mm -hmm. I think that's apparent from from just from looking at it too. I'm not sure, but. It, it does seem to drive everyone else crazy, which tells me that maybe that's true. I might just be a massive narcissist. Uh, I don't know, because I... F I do have my own podcast. Well, true, but I mean, I helped spur you that's on. That's true. Otherwise, I mean, there wouldn't be a podcast. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I enjoy just kind of browsing. I've never really spent a lot of time browsing your, your shelves, but I do enjoy just kind of casually looking through and seeing what's on the shelf. 
I don't know if that gives you any kind of insight into the kind of person. Because, again, you don't know what they've read. Unless they've said that they've read the books, that might give you some insight into who they are based on their choices. But, I don't know, I, I just like looking at libraries and, you know, imagining it gives you a window into somebody else or into what they value, what they think about, and whatnot. I don't know that I would ever judge a person based on the books that they've read. I would judge them based on the books that they reread. That'd be fair. Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, reading a book once, whatever. It's like watching a movie once. I will go and see a crappy movie. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I'm going to have a good time with friends or, or whatever, you go and see a crappy movie. I mean, the same way that you'll read a crappy book because, I mean, it's not going to take up that much of your time or you're in an airport or hmm. whatever. I mean, it's just a bad book. The question is whether or not you will reread that book. Mm -hmm. Given in the opportunity and given the choice to read other books... Will you read this book? And I can think of a whole bunch of books that I would reread in a heartbeat. Mm. Um, and I'm they, a bunch of them are sitting on my shelves. I just brought them back from from my aunt's house, and they're waiting for me to reread them because I read them at a certain point in my life, and now I want to read them again and see what they're like, and see what and see how different I am when I read them. But yeah, it's the it's the rereading that matters, I think, because that's. That's a bigger choice. Mm -hmm. No, it's true because whatever you choose to invest your time in does say a lot about mm -hmm. you or at least what you value. I guess maybe the most I can do by looking at somebody's library is I can try to infer things yeah. based on it. But yeah, you should, I, I think you're, maybe you're right about that. You can't really judge. Or the books they say they like on Facebook. Yeah. Um, or, or good reads. I, I know. Well, we, we, we talked at one point about having a podcast about our thoughts about the idea of narcissism in a social media age but maybe that's a topic for another time yeah i think so we, i mean we are running low on time so maybe we should wrap it up but before we wrap it up i do want to say that throw a footnote onto this entire episode in terms of my opinion asterisk asterisk because no matter how how many books i have whether or not i use them as a status symbol I also believe that we should support our local public libraries. So no matter how many books that you have, I, I want to throw that out there. That, I, that I don't really go to the local public library. I don't think you... Not because I hate them, um, and not because uh, they're bad. Our local public library is awesome. Yeah. Uh, and I've been there. Actually, when I do go there, I go there with, with uh, my nieces or, or with kids. But no, it's mostly because, A, I already have far more books than I just commute to read. Mm -hmm. And B... Uh, one time, when I was much, much younger, I took out a whole ton of books, and I wound up owing them, like, hundreds and hundreds of dollars, and they sent it. They, they were, like, they were on the verge of sending ninjas to kill me. They were really mad. Okay. And, and they have entirely forgiven me, but I have yet to forgive myself. Okay, so I guess maybe I should I should rephrase my statement that even though you and I both have large extensive libraries that is we're not trying to make any kind of value judgment that this is something that anybody should strive towards reading is important that's the only important thing but I think like I just sit and think about libraries like public libraries and I just I'm, I'm, it blows my mind the concept of this idea that is a free free access location of the it, it's a it's a building of knowledge that anybody can access you just need a, a public, or you don't even need yep. a library card. You can you can just walk in and read and there. read books. You you need the card to, to take it out and like promise that you'll bring it back. Or you, but because I I just recently switched from the Kitchener one to the Waterloo one because I, I didn't realize that I had to. I walked in there and I asked them. And they said yes. So I said okay, fine. Sign me up since I live in Waterloo. I, my taxes will go to the Waterloo one because that's where yeah. it happens to be. But um, so yeah, I just want to just throw an, an asterisk on there, even though we haven't in any way said that this is the way you should live your life but um, at the it's very least the way that we do at the very least you should learn from you. our folly if you can't learn from our wisdom well support your public libraries that's all i want to say and i think we should probably wrap it up there. yeah so with that we will sign off i'm jim and i'm ryan stay awesome stay awesome high five it is the best way to sync up anything well until we get the we're never gonna have one i'm never gonna get one you you are a part of the the maker lab why can't that just be made well of course i could build one but that would take away time from building anything else but that all right all right you, you got a point there <laughs> when we have an intern we'll have our intern come in and be all like with it just with their hands can you imagine a third person in here no <laughs>